Welcome, everyone, to District Divided, a DC sports podcast. More specifically, a Washington Commanders podcast. I am Amit. That is KDOT. Before we begin this episode, just covering a couple signings the team made. We've got some audio from Tom Palacero of NFL Network uh, talking about JJ McCarthy uh, potentially being in play at pick number two for the team. And we've got the LSU Pro Day, the UNC Pro Day for Jaden Daniels and Drake May, respectively, common mailbag and everything. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, comment as you always do, and KDOT. Share this shit. Be an evangelist of the Divided Crew. Please share this shit. We greatly appreciate that. And, and before... fuck you, Ted Leonsis. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, my gosh. Uh, before we get into that, and we could do a quick minute on that, just want to say a very happy belated birthday to Polly Polo, who does the intro music for us over here at District Divided. Greatly appreciate you, brother. Love you. And a very happy birthday today uh, to my sister, Aww. Nandini. Love you lots, sis. And we will celebrate later. So Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Nandini. All right. So let's talk about Ted Leonsis real quick. Hilarious. This entire thing has been Absolutely hilarious, Kato. But he still managed to get $515 million from the city. So there's also that. But the way he looks is just terrible. It's just, it's such an amateur hour shit, right? If, and the thing is that $500 million is what he was kind of getting out the door anyway. When yeah. you remember the Bowser came up with it right when they were <laughs> making the announcement. But the idea that you would have that much bravado to announce and to do all the pomp and circumstance without getting what it is you need to get cleared politically is fucking nuts to me. Like the idea that like Dan Snyder might have gotten closer with the commanders getting the fishing if what name wasn't Dan Snyder than um fucking Ted Leonsis. It, it it's it's so the the amount of shit he needs to eat right now and to putting his tail between his legs and come crawling back home is just hilarious to me. It's fucking hilarious. From an optic standpoint, this could not have got worse for him. I mean, this is just Terrible. And then his statement about like, oh, man, love DC. You see his tweets, record attendances. Like he's so quickly trying to turn around. Ticket sales. You guys are great. That's why I want to leave you. The turnstiles. Anyway, um, we're Commander's Podcast. So let's go ahead and review the couple signings that we made. Okay, so we made an offensive line depth signing, maybe even competition for a starting position in Michael Dieter from the Houston Texans. He started 10 games for them last season, played in 16 from the University of Wisconsin. Buddies with Tyler Biotish, or at the very least played on the offensive line with Tyler Biotish. He can play center. He mm-hmm. can play left guard. So mm-hmm. that is another example of a versatile signing. And then more recently, signing wide receiver Olamid Zacchaeus, who most recently played with the Philadelphia Eagles, but also spent some time with the Atlanta Falcons, where Dan Quinn was coach, of course. So there is a bit of a connection there. KDOT, either of those signings, do they move the needle for you? Same sort of question with these depth type signings. Do they move the needle for you? Are you pleased with them? What are your thoughts? Yeah, they both move the needle. Just a matter of like how much would the, uh, the Zacchaeus, what the hell is that? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Um, he, that's a lot less, even though if you look, I think he had his best year ever last year with Philadelphia. Um, you look, we got rid of Curtis Samuel. I'm upset with De'Ami Brown constantly. So there is an aspect of like just adding another body to that area, um, especially when you're talking about like, I know that we're not necessarily going to be running the air raid the way that Cliff Kingsbury has. Um, I, the more and more you dig into it, the more it seems like maybe it's a West Coast sort of thing we might be doing. I'm not sure. But the uh, idea of just getting more receivers that can run some goddamn routes and help out your quarterback, all all good. Um, but the Michael Dieter, that, that signing is the one that really does move the needle a bit for me um, in the sense of, I know that we went through our free agency wish list. And one of my things that I really wanted was a veteran as far as its center. Um, mm-hmm. And the idea that you have a guy who has that flexibility as far as where it is, he could start on that offensive line just adds so much help as far as depth. But then more, even more importantly than that, one of the big things that I've talked about is if you do draft a quarterback, the last thing you want is any sort of rookie uh, center 
exchanging with the quarterback itself just because it's a hard – the center quarterback relationship is extremely important when in the league. And a lot of times what you'd like your quarterback to do is kind of lean on the center that has more experience. Um, and then you're talking about Michael Dieter. Who was this quarterback last year? All right, C.J. Stroud. So you're talking about a dude that has experience, and we saw what C.J. Stroud was able to do. We're not giving Michael Dieter all the credit for what C.J. Stroud is doing, but the idea is you have somebody who has experience in that particular role, and it worked out, so he knows what to look for. Maybe he's, if we're keeping the lines of communication up within the uh, organization, and people are listening to ideas and stuff. He could talk about what worked with CJ, how he it is that he himself can be there for whatever rookie quarterback, whatever the situation is a quarterback there for. So I love that signing. I love the idea that every day that goes by, it feels as though one of those needs that we have just get eliminated and it, it gets you into that position where you can truly go into the draft, looking at best player available. Yeah. Ex- I'm going to echo your sentiments exactly. And, Again, the Michael Dieter signing to me also a guy that started 10 games on the offensive line. Whenever you can get guys that have played uh, offensive line specifically and started games, that's very useful. Now, again, like you had mentioned, CJ Stroud, that was last year's number two overall pick. And then we look at the Marcus Mariota signing a former number two overall pick, former Heisman Trophy winner. It seems like we're doing a lot of these one year deals to set up the necessary leadership group to help this quarterback that's coming in. I think more and more I look at these moves more and more I feel we stay at pick number two. I know that there have been ideas that we have been fielding calls, but not too seriously. I buy into that idea that we are not taking them too seriously, that we are quite adamant that we're going to stick at two overall. The Olamide Zakia signing, I think he could have a couple of big catches down the stretch in the season. Who knows? I think our wide receiver room short of Terry and Jahan is still figuring itself out. So we'll see what happens over there. But speaking about that number two overall pick, on the insiders. Uh, now that features Tom Pelissero, that features Ian Rappaport, that features, I think, Mike Garofolo and Steve Weish, at least in this particular uh episode. There was some talk from Mike Garofolo about uh Jaden Daniels probably being the guy from what he can surmise, from what he can guess, and all the info that he's got. But he also acknowledges, hey, it's not exactly close to the team either. So He's not really sure. And then Tom Pelissero, we're going to try and pump some audio here for you in just a moment. So hopefully this works. If not, please let us know in the comments. We will never do this again. Uh, But Tom Pelissero uh, ended up saying something a bit interesting. Uh, And so we're going to go ahead and play that audio for you now. Take a listen. It's been really interesting because everybody's always trying to figure out, especially at the top of the graph, what the other teams are doing. When I've had conversations here with executives for other teams who know Adam Peters well, know the situation well, the most popular answer for what they do at number two is J.J. McCarthy. So, he said that. And all of a sudden, Commander's Twitter got on it and said, wait, what? And I'm not going to lie. I got on it and said, wait, what? KDOT, the question is simple. Do you believe that? And is J.J. McCarthy truly in play at pick two overall. Okay. I like how you formed that. Um, do I believe it? No, because I don't believe anything right now. There's nothing to believe with anyone. If somebody, if Tom Bellasera could have came out there and echoed what everybody else was saying about like Jane Daniels, and I still would have been like, you know, you could ask me that exact same question and be like, no, I don't believe it because I don't believe anything that anyone's saying right now. We are in full blown lying season. Okay. This yeah. is the positioning that you're. Like that's the, the same thing we led into this is just like, would Washington move back from two? No one knows anything because everybody's keeping their cards as close to the goddamn chest as they can, right? Because it gives you the flexibility, gives you the options of like not knowing. Nobody needs to know what anybody else is thinking or doing because you can try to play that information off of somebody to get something more than what it is you got right now, right? So no, you shouldn't trust anything that anyone is saying about anything related to anything football wise right now. Shouldn't you? Shouldn't. Um, the, the other aspect of it in the sense that like, well, you know, I'll get to that in a sec. Um, the, the, what was your second question? It was, do, do I believe it's happening? And then do you believe his words? And do you believe believe that he is actually in play at pick two? I wouldn't be surprised if he was, if he was like, I'm, I don't think people take me seriously enough. When I say outside of Caleb Williams, I love the Lex three guys just as much. Is like I I don't I I'm they are interchangeable to me because I look at each of them individually and what it is that they bring to the table and I say that if developed properly I adore any one of them and the idea to me 
and this is where we get to like I, I if the team likes that quarterback, you yeah. go get the guy. I don't I don't understand all this bullshit games and stuff that people try to play. If you like the guy, go get the guy. <laughs> no one's gonna remember anything else if it, it works or it doesn't work. Did you get your guy? That's it. No one gives a shit about anything else. Like if you if they draft JJ second, right? And we're in a fucking Super Bowl two years from now. Are you gonna oh well, uh, you know uh, no shut the fuck no one's gonna care. No one's gonna you say that the if right we're in guy. a Super Bowl in two years. Right. Well in five I don't give a shit. The the idea is as long as you're not picking someone before someone that absolutely blows them out of the water, you're fine. And there's no reason for me looking at everything that makes me believe that there's not a serious possibility if developed property, J.J. McCarthy could be the best quarterback out of this fucking draft. So there are a couple things that came up for me when I first heard Tom Pelissero say that. And once again, I hope the audio worked there for you guys. Uh, otherwise, it's in the it's in the description. So <laughs> I really hope that worked. Um, a couple things came up. One, of course, immediately was no. Because I have been pretty adamant here that I prefer Jaden Daniels, right? I prefer him to Drake May as well. I even prefer him to Caleb Williams. I want Jaden Daniels. I feel we're in a position to do that. That would be awesome. The other thing that did come up, and this is the more logical side of things, because Adam Peters had also mentioned, hey, we are not, uh, we are in a position where we do not have to rush the right. quarterback to immediately enter and then Dan Quinn had mentioned, we're going to play the guy that gives us the best chance to win. So that could mean just the number two pick starts. But if, and, and go with me here, KDOT, mm -hmm. if we did commit to not playing the quarterback for a year, then the question to me becomes, who do we think is the best one after a year sitting? Mm -hmm. And that could be a different answer than Jaden Daniels, potentially. Because when we do... When you look at film, when I look at film, like when we look at games, basically, because uh, that's about all we have of LSU, of UNC, of Michigan, even yeah. we can only see so much. Uh, and from what we see, uh, Jaden Daniels is the Heisman Trophy winner. So, of course, he's going to look great. He rushed for over, I think, 1200. yards. Of course, that looks great. Like he's a very exciting player. But yeah. does that mean if he were to sit for one year and JJ were to sit for one year that Jaden's better after that time period? Maybe not. So I was thinking about it from that perspective of if we are willing to sit the guy and wait, maybe a different player that's not as obvious, like JJ for me, is the better player for us. Does that make sense? No. Okay, so <laughs> let me try again. Okay. If we feel that one of these quarterbacks or maybe it does, I just is, don't better, <laughs> is better equipped for our system and is a very sharp learner, very quick learner, has those intangibles of leadership and stuff like that, that our guys will value, right? Would that ultimately be a better fit a year from now if we're not playing him immediately? Okay. Does that make sense? That's what yeah. I'm trying to say. I just, I disagree with you. So okay. the, uh, that's fine. So it's the, what came up for me. So that's, so like the, the thing is for me is that me and you have been going through these exercises as far as like what to do at quarterback, what to do with the second pick, right? Overall. Yeah. And me and you were both on the same page. I think that I've, I've, I don't think you I don't think you were always there with me. I think you're definitely there with me now in the sense of like sit a motherfucker as long as it takes to to get yeah. them to where it is need to be. Um, I'm not looking for who's going to come out the gate looking best. I give two shits about that. I care about who is long term going to be the solution at quarterback. So like and if Adam Peters or Dan Quinn are not making a decision based on that, then they should be fucking fired. Like as much as like who's who does that? Like the idea is, and especially after hearing Adam Peters talk, and the one thing that we can say about Adam Peters is that he hasn't lied to us. Everything you can go back and listen to, every single thing that he's said since he's gotten in the door, and what he hasn't is, said, and what he has hasn't said, very true. important, right? He's very yeah. strategic in what he says and what he hasn't said. It's all kind of come to for you. You're like, oh, yeah, no, that checks out. That's exactly what it is. When you listen to what he said about coach, and then Dan Quinn gets hired. You couldn't necessarily say the exact same things about Mike McDowell. You couldn't necessarily say the same things about a lot of the other guys. It makes sense, right? Like there is an element. And then the, the, the idea that he's basically telling you, yeah, we're completely content with being patient on this is basically what mm -hmm. he's telling you. Then to me, it's like, 
No shit. Thank you. <laughs> like you're not you're not doing this to save your jobs. You guys are doing this to try to make the team as good as it possibly can be. And that when I when I look at that is where I'm looking at like, yeah, J- Jaden Daniels off the gate because of his running ability will allow him as a lot of these young quarterbacks do that don't do a great job in the pocket will allow you to buy yourself some time will allow yourself to make some positive plays when you don't, when they're not necessarily there or you mm-hmm. can't even read the defense properly. There is an onus to, there's absolutely some to, if you're a more athletic quarterback, you got more tools like that in your shed, then you can absolutely do more early than other guys can. Right. And, and sure. early is not necessarily the answer you're looking for to your point. It is longer term. What I was saying was I was going, hey, maybe when I was looking at these guys, maybe I was guilty of being the more in the moment. I think this guy's good. And then fantasizing the projection. Does that make sense of like, OK, he's sure. so good now. Yeah. Imagine what he could be because I'm imagining a ceiling for everybody based off of what I see now. Yeah. So th- there's that element yeah. to it. I also wanted to quickly point out um uh, for the audience, because I think this is very useful for moving forward, the difference between what Adam Peters said and what Dan Quinn said. Mm-hmm. So Adam Peters said, hey, we're content to to wait. We're not in a position where we need to rush uh, our guy in there. And then you hear Dan Quinn say, uh, we're going to give us we're going to play the guy that gives us the best chance That's to win now. Win. That is long term versus potentially short term. Right. Just the just in terms answer. of. Yeah, a coach's answer being more short term of like, hey, we want to win now. And the long term answer of the general manager, they're on the same page, just to be clear. But the long term view of the general manager, the shorter term view of the head coach. Just wanted to point that out. They're not that divergent. So like the 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 idea is that you want to put yourself in the best position to potentially be holding that Lombardi trophy at the end of this year, at the end of the year. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And to me, it's like there are certain steps that you will take as far as what you need to do to develop a guy. What doesn't work in your benefit is if you have a guy that you start immediately that can't necessarily read the offense, but does have the athletic ability to make some plays run, but then gets fucking hurt because the offensive line's not great or because he's doing things that are entirely too risky. And then you got to shut him down and start Marcus Mariota fucking anyway. Right. So like the idea is what everything that you're doing as far as long term stuff can kind of coincide with what's best for the team in the moment. Okay. At any point in time, those things should kind of be together. But if you're the head coach, you can't look at your team full of a bunch of veterans, full of guys you just signed on one year contracts and let them know, hey, this is all just a test year. Like you like we're 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 just building guys. We're not contenders this year. Nobody wants to fucking hear that from the head coach, right? Right. Regardless of what the long term play is. Um, and this is where you have guys working together. The head coach should make a lot of decisions, but it's the decision that he makes with the rest of the brass that are around, as long as it's not ownership. Adam Peters should be involved in what it is that's happening with the roster long term. Right. He's mm-hmm. got to be a part of that. And Dan Quinn has to be a part of that, too. And if Adam and ultimately Peter- the pick belongs to him. And Dan has right. said that over and over. It's important right. that you guys know that, too. The right. responsibility of pick two is not Dan Quinn's. He can right. voice his what he wants. But ultimately, this is Adam Peters choice from what they have all told us. One hundred percent. And the thing is, like, so like what I keep preaching, because what I want to get back to the J.J. McCarthy thing was your initial reaction of being negative on the pick now there is the element that you've let me know which is uh our number one super fan matthew regan being a michigan graduate and you not wanting to have his quarterback here. i don't want that right i get it i get it i hate matthew too i hate mr regan as well but i do kind of like said the, that i just said i well, don't want i like the idea of him being more known as our guy than his guy kind of taking him from him. I, I don't mind that the uh, but whatever how does you sell yourself way. <laughs> look at the end of the day, I what I because I, I have seen that reaction from most of the fans. This is like the JJ at two feels like a, a slap in the face. And it's this I don't I don't know what anyone's saying. The uh, the hard thing on the evaluation of JJ McCarthy. Uh-huh. Okay, here we go. Yeah. That Michigan team was incredible. They were always playing with leads. Whenever he was really called upon to do something, he did it. He did. But there were so few instances of it. It's just the small sample size nature of that. Mm -hmm. When Jim Harbaugh gets suspended and then Sharon Moore is coaching, well, what does he do at Penn State? He goes, okay, we are just going to run, 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 run. J.J. McCarthy threw the ball eight times. If he is that good, I would assume that they would have used him more. I don't feel like they used him a whole lot. They didn't need to. Why? The goal goal is to have Michigan win. The goal is to have Michigan win the games. I get that. championship. 
Yeah, but you would also think that they would be able to use him also. They ended up winning the whole thing. Now, see, that's where I think the people get misinterpreted what Jim Harbaugh is doing. Jim Harbaugh wants to win a national championship, and we're yeah. going to do that by any means. But being in college and saying, hey, I need a guy to throw 50 times a fucking game just because he can um, is not necessarily the same it's, thing. as it, It's yeah. not just for the sake of it. Yeah, but I'm saying I that, get that. But the thing is, like, if I were to look through and see how many third down plays that were needed in crunch time, and JJ made the play. I it kind of screams off the page compared to some of the other guys. The the idea as far as what you see in the red zone, yeah, the red zone throws and the way in the poison which he plays in the red zone as far as um J- JJ to me is somebody who does exactly what is asked of him and does it to the best of his best of his abilities without complaint, being the greatest teammate he could possibly be, being a great leader amongst those men. And the thing that we also have to realize is that. Jim Harbaugh has been at Michigan for how long? It was seven years, eight years, something like that. Been it a while. took JJ and him to win, to win a national championship. He was there. It's not like Michigan's recruiting class has been ass. I'm, but not, it saying, did. I'm not saying JJ's bad either. He's the best QB that Jim has had. Right. But, but, but that. it, that's 100%. But that's the yeah. thing. Is like it t- but it took that combination of guys to go and bring a national championship to Michigan. You, and, you know what happened? You know what happened? I'll tell you exactly what happened. I finally decided to have an open mind on JJ. So, of course, Matt, uh, our friend, former co-host of the show, he occasionally comments as well, was talking about JJ, 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 whatever. And I'm, I'm seeing a lot of Blake Corum. I'm seeing a lot of Donovan Edwards. They're running backs, right? Um, I'm seeing a lot of that Michigan defense, okay? That's what I'm seeing. And then the national semifinal comes on, and I go, okay, you know what? He's playing against Bama. Let's see how he does. And my mind immediately closed. The very first throw when he threw an interception, yeah. and fortunately the guy landed out of bounds. Mm-hmm. But I was just like, okay, nope, can't do it. I tried to I tried to open my heart to this guy. I tried to open my mind to this guy. I can't right. fucking do it. And that was enough. And he ended up throwing for three touchdowns. He ended up having a good game, but I just could not see beyond that point. I was just like, no, 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 no. See, no. this is what I'm, the same thing I said about head coach, right? Which is that you need to make sure you do not put those blinders on to the other guy. Don't get a favorite guy. The 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 getting the tunnel vision for the favorite. Look, I was I was the first. I know that you were with me from day one, but when I said last year at the end of last season that Jaden Daniels was my favorite quarterback, maybe in the entire draft, right? Yeah. I say that, but there is not one part of me since that day. That you can tell that I have a true one A when it comes to these quarterbacks that are coming out of this draft. Like I look at Caleb Williams as a tier above. I do just because I just think he's awesome. But then I look at the other three guys and saying that like if any one of them get picked at number two, I adore it. Jaden Daniels and what he can do running that goddamn football and his accuracy reminds me of like almost an RG three that's better, right? Like I I, I get there. There are elements of Jaden Daniels that are just why, awesome. why, why don't we get to why don't we get to the pro days now? Because now we're starting to talk about them. All right, Go ahead. Let me let me talk about JJ then for a second. Just to, for anybody that's on the fence about JJ or they think that um he's clearly not as good as the other things, uh, as the other guys. He's not. Look, there are a lot of Heisman Trophy winners that end up being not working out in the fucking NFL. There are a ton of guys that look great in all sorts of circumstances and never turn out in the NFL. I look for certain things as far as like what happens in the evaluation and development process that turns good guys and bad guys or whatever, right? And there are certain characteristics in the intangibles that I look at with J.J. McCarthy, and I actually look through any of the quarterbacks in this draft to say he's number one for me. And on intangibles, he is absolutely number one for me, and it's not close. The idea, if you understand this dude's story, what he was able to do in in high school, winning the net, winning the state championship game his sophomore fucking year, the dude did it. With a goddamn broken finger. He did it with even fucking order. So his wrist was broken. He had to go and ask his parents to sign a waiver. He had to keep it secret to sign a waiver so that he was allowed to play. Nobody found out about it until afterwards, right? Then his junior year, he loses in the national championship game. The night after, this fucker has a whiteboard in his bedroom and he's vision board. He's writing all the shit all night long. His parents wake up at like 5 30 in the morning. Jay, I got to go for a run. Motherfucker goes and runs five miles, comes back home, goes right back out to train. He's with his teammates. They need to work on what the fuck needs to happen next year. Then you look at, all right, senior year. 
Oh, hold on. At sophomore year, before he plays in that game, right, with broken wrist, he gets an offer, full, full scholarship from Iowa State. Anyone would tell you if you have a broken wrist going into that game, don't fucking play. It's going to ruin your scholarship chance. He didn't give a fuck. I'm doing what I need to do to win this shit for my team. The intangibles, a winner, right? A dude that's going to try his ass off. But his senior year, he goes and visits Michigan. Big Michigan guy. Love, or no, sorry, goes to visit Ohio State, Ohio State. Loves Ohio State. Loves Ryan Day. Loves all those guys. They love him. He, they talk, and Ryan Day promises him, we are not going to sign another recruit before the, before the end of the summer. You're our number one guy. We're not going to sign another recruit. And they fucking turn around like two weeks later and they do it. So JJ says, huh, Who'd they get? I, I, I forget. It was another recruit that they had. He ended I just up not wanted being it to JJ. be CJ Strash. It wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't CJ Strash. That was a good choice. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. But, uh, what JJ ends up doing is that he says, oh, okay. He immediately books a trip to fucking Michigan. Okay, to I respect sure. that. I so respect he, that. Okay. He goes cool. and he, he goes to fucking Michigan, falls in love with it. He said that when he went to Ohio State compared to Michigan, Michigan felt like a fucking family. It felt like an environment in which Ohio State only cared about what you produced on the field. Michigan was about what it is you could do as a team and as a family. So he was like, I'm sold. And you know what that fucker did since he went to Michigan? Never fucking lost to Ohio State. When's the last time you seen a Michigan quarterback do that shit? He has the best record in the history of the University of Michigan against Ohio State. They could lose against Ohio State when he was there. You want to talk about chip on your shoulder? Here's the thing. The recruiting story might not even be fully accurate, but it's what he tells himself. This is the Tom Brady, Michael Jordan shit, right? That's that shit where if there aren't fucking chips on my shoulder, guess what? I'll create them sons of bitches. That's your J.J. McCarthy. The dude's a dog. When you talk about like that, that intangible just, I'm going to beat you. I'm going to do everything in my fucking power to beat you. I'm a student of the game. This motherfucker meditates. I love a meditating quarterback. <laughs> like, that's his kind of shit. I'm sorry. If you start digging into the J.J. McCarthy story, if you start listening to that dude talk, <laughs> everybody's scared to do it. And it's stupid to do it because you shouldn't compare it on a national level. But when you hear about the comparison between him and like Tom Brady back at Michigan, you start seeing these draw these parallels where you look at when you're looking for the intangibles that are hard to read through, right? People are getting upset about Caleb Williams like wearing pink and having the nail polish shit. I love it. He's our first true Gen Z. We, we can talk about it after. Bob. All that shit. But JJ, when you're talking about a dude that's going to do anything it takes to win the game and to make sure you feel bad about not picking him or whatever it is that he imagines that you did to him, he's that guy, which is why when you look at what he did at Michigan and why people criticize that he didn't throw a lot this, that, and the other, you know what he did? Coach Harbaugh, what do we need to do to win the fucking game? All I need you to do is throw 10, 10 times. You will get the best goddamn 10 throws you're ever going to see from me. He delivers. I would love, with pick two, I would love Jaden Daniels. I'd be happy with Drake May. I'd hope for the best with J.J. McCarthy. You and choose maybe he can the guy vision board himself into pick two. It's entirely <laughs> possible. But now, let's talk can about I, I, one last the thing. pro. No. Let's talk about the pro. All right, fine. I, I got let's talk about the pro days. You can squeeze it right back I got in. Two JJ the pro days. You just God went on eight minutes of JJ McCarthy talk. As he we should. Y'all are disrespecting about, JJ. We're talking about the LSU pro day. My guy, Jaden Daniels. And the UNC pro day. My other guy, Drake May. Really just not JJ for me. Um, so we begin with the LSU pro day. And there was a moment, K Dot, where Jaden's with his guys, throwing the ball, et cetera. And then he's interviewing. Uh, with I think it's Cameron Wolf over at NFL Plus, and then it goes over. I sent this to you. It goes over to Dan Quinn and Adam Peters, and um, and it shows them like dapping each other up, and all of a sudden, Adam Peters is smiling. Dan Quinn's smiling. Looks like a kid at a candy store. And the question is, is that something, K dot, or is that nothing? Go ahead. Now, when you sent me that, this was also off the heels of Tom Pelissera saying that that is exactly right. And I guess audience, <laughs> it's good that you know that context. Go ahead. <laughs> That's the thing. Everybody's trying to read to the team just because they don't want it to be JJ. So whatever the fuck it is to show something else, let's rock and run with it, which is... I to, think be, had a to be fair, I told you it wasn't something. Right. I told you it was everything. Yeah. It's fucking crazy. The thing is that 
he's playing with Adam. <laughs> like, they, I, like, even when I'm watching the thing, it's like, he's not, he's just playing around with Adam. We, you were talking before the pod, Dan Quinn is so happy to be a head coach again. It's oozing off of him. Yes, Adam yes. Peters hasn't stopped smiling since he walked in the door. Since he this got off true. the fucking plane in the snow with his family, he's had this same goddamn dumb smile on his face. <laughs> just everywhere he's fucking going. They're just happy to be there. They're flying around, jet setting. They're the guys now. Like, it feels good. And they're having fun. It's a fucking pro day. Nobody should take any of this shit seriously. That's, That's what true. They're... Which is, well, we'll get into more of the pro day aspect of this. But, yes, the, th- but that part of it, I don't know how anyone can read anything other than they're having a good time. <laughs> like, what the fuck else is It's not like he... We didn't see him with a board that said, like, Jaden had a bunch of circles around something. He's like, ha, ah, ah, he's like, yeah. The, the human mind is a very powerful thing. Yes, and so when I, when I saw that on the heels of the J.J. McCarthy thing, my mind immediately went to thinking of all the moments where you just grab your boy and you're like, yeah, like, you know, you just did something and it's just hype and it's exciting. And I was like, that is Dan Quinn saying, that's our guy. He saw that the camera. That is what I'm just saying. That's what I wanted. You said. You think he just saw the camera and did that? There's literally a screenshot of him looking directly in the camera's lens. The human being he decided to just look <laughs> at the camera, okay? He's just like, we're we're having fun. What does he do? He tries to like point at Adam. It's almost like he's trying to do some. I think he was going to do something else with Adam and I realized, oh shit, camera's oh, you thought he was just fucking with the camera. He's, he's like, fucking hey, what if we with do Adam. This and just. I think it, like if it was up, if you leave the camera on, they probably fake. We made we made each you other. a separate video where we just break down the the body language. What you just of... saw is a glimpse of what it's going to be like near their offices. They're just going to be having fun. That's fair. They're just going to be having a good time, dude. So much better than what usually Ashburn's like, right? Like, let's keep the positive vibes going. I love it. When I saw that, you know, what I saw, I saw, I loved. These are our guys. The professionals getting the fucking job done. They're having a blast that. doing it. Yeah. That's cool as shit. That part of it, I'm all for. I've loved every interview that Adam Peters has given. I've loved every interview that Dave Quinn has given. Uh, Josh Harris being available to the goddamn media. They, they By the way, Josh awesome. Harris speaks really well. Dude. Speaks really, really well. <laughs> Just both the intro press conferences for Adam Peters and, um, and Dan Quinn, respectively. I have come away very impressed with Josh Harris speaking. Just as impressed as Dan Quinn, just as impressed as Adam Peters. I was like, yo, Josh, for the initial awkwardness of the Joe Buck handshake. Yeah. The guy is really, really confident in himself, very well spoken and knows exactly what to say. Like he he gets it. He's great. He's fine. Like, all I'm saying, everything's great. better than fucking Dan. Which that's is true. Like, Maybe we, that's the other thing. That's the other thing is like the the I like having the media access that we're having to him and him just kind of speaking off the cuff that you know it wasn't a list of pre approved fucking questions. Because if it wasn't, then Tony Wiley's going to fucking put a goddamn gag over your face and wheel you out, some bitch. Like, it's we just have like this is. I love what it is you're seeing around the organization. That whole thing about having that through line, about knowing everybody's on the same page, about knowing everybody's having a good time. You even hear it in the free agent signings that we're getting. Like, the, everyone's on the same page. We're going to work our asses off. We're going to have a fucking blast doing this shit. And we're going to, this is what we're doing. This is the new vibe. This is the new vibe. Okay. So that's the LSU Pro Day. You see that something or nothing moment. Um, and then, of course, is the UNC Pro Day as well, where Drake May had the opportunity to run, to throw, to do all that jazz. Um, and then, of course, you see, to your point, KDOT, Adam Peters and Dan Quinn smiling, having a good time, enjoying themselves, chatting with Drake May. They are having the time of their lives. I agree with you. I don't think there's anything you can take away from a Pro Day, right? And people have said it over and over in the media, right? It is a series of scripted plays where these guys are in a perfect environment, sort of like J.J. McCarthy that they can just do whatever they need to do, and it's easy. I heard JJ's was the best pro day everybody's ever seen. They're just throwing that out there. No, the, it's a lying season, isn't it? Uh, and so, yeah. Well, anyway. it was a little before lying season. But regardless. <laughs> Any well, thoughts on the UNC pro day? The, the thoughts on both pro days are the fucking same. If you are going to a pro day, to if, you, if any organization walks into a pro day, and uh, based on Jets. what they see on the field, uh, for the longest time, the fucking Raiders, Jamar Russell. If, oh if God, what absolutely. you see happens at Pro Day, 
has any true impact on what it is that happens on your draft board, you're going to get fired soon. Like there's 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 no reason that, that anything be at the benchmark. pro day on the field. Just to be clear, that's what I said the, the on the field. field. Right, right. And the, I want to make that pro clear. day is about off the field. So like, yes. here's the thing that people need to realize is that this time period right now is for coaches to get on board with what the decision making is being. Your scouts, the front office, everybody else should are everyone in the organization should already have their opinion outside of the coaching staff on who it is their guy is. The only reason your coaches should is because they should have been busy doing coaching. So, like, mm-hmm. now they're at a point where they got to play catch-up. And then they have to, they got to listen to the scouts. They've got to go meet these guys, see if the personalities match, see all that kind of stuff. And all that's happening in the meetings. But there it goes back to, what did Dan Quinn say? This is Adam's pick. So I go back to exactly what I said very carefully. This is for the coaches to get acclimated with what the pick is going to be. Which is why I hope Tom Palacero is lying. But... I've also got time. I will be more objective and Can clear-minded. I, I'm going to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to read something. Fine, go ahead. It might sound crazy, but when we lose, it sucks really bad. But I'm also excited about it. I'm like, okay, what can I get better at? Failure? I'm not scared of it. I'm actually excited when that happens sometimes because you get to figure out what you did so it doesn't happen again. You know what that sounds like? It sounds like a little Dan Quinn. That sounds like some of these other guys that have been here on the team, you know. When they, when I hear, when I see, when I hear that, like they took, they they went and they met up with JJ, and afterwards you turn here, like, you know what? This organization, these commanders team, they're really looking for a special kind of cloth of guy. They're looking for a guy. They don't have to kind of get the buy in of the way that they want to do things. That they want to learn from the mistakes. They want to be truly. They want to play with that fucking edge, right? Ain't no selling with JJ. He's already there. He's a Dan Quinn guy. All right. He's a guy that understands you got to learn from your mistakes. When 28 to 3 gets told to Dan Quinn, you know what he says? Ha! I, I learned from my mistakes, motherfucker. And I can't wait to show you that I learned from my mistakes. And that's what you get with a JJ McCarthy. He's a dude that understands that he's got to come in and do everything he got to do be the best motherfucker on that goddamn field. And there's only a few dudes to get there. There's the Kobe Bryants. There's the Tom Brady's. There's the fucking Michael Jordans. The dudes that you know when you listen to them, they're a little sick in the head about it, right? That's JJ. He's sick in the head. And I like it. I like it a lot. So we have A-Train, and that was the Reverend K-Dot letting you know his thoughts on JJ. The district divided the list! He's here! We go over to the comment mailbag and we appreciate both that from UK dot and the many comments that we got for this episode. And without further ado, we are going to begin reading them beginning with Chad Wilson, 6870 shout out Chad Wilson with the first comment trade for Caleb. And it's got three likes over there. Appreciate the comment there. Do you see us K dot trading up for Caleb? I don't know. Do I think we have enough ammunition to do it? Yep. Um, uh, it just goes back to, I don't know. Would I love to see it? Probably not. Just because, like, once again, I really like the other three guys. I just cannot stress to you guys how much I don't think there's a huge difference between these two. <laughs> I just don't. I think, and I think we're on the same smaller. page about it being much more about the situation of the team versus the quarterback themselves. And because the time process. and time again, we get these evaluations. And why are they so wrong? Oftentimes, it's situation, not the player. Right. So it's important to note that. And that's why we have both loved the offseason so much so far. Important yep. to note. Uh, thank you, Chad Wilson, for the comment there. Appreciate that. Then we go to Philly CK. Uh, 9BH. Hope so. My Bears need some more picks. So that is in favor of trading up from a Bears fan. But then we go over to FLA Bears. So I think Florida Bears fan 6698. Sorry, boys. Looks like we are getting him in reference to Caleb Williams. Bear down. Okay. So some division amongst Bears fans over there. K dot seems like you want to say something. Bunch of Chicagoans on our goddamn page. Go back you to Chicago. Yeah, because there's the oh, there's the Justin Fields camp. They're probably upset. There's the yep. people that were just off of Justin Fields. So all they're doing is searching for any sort of reason, the same way that our fans are, of like, uh, what I believe needs to be true. So I need to find something to validate my feelings. Well, we got another Bears fan, Terry Wags, nine eighty two. I would trade with Washington in a heartbeat. Yep. I want their number two pick this draft. And their first round picks the next three years yeah, because they are awful and will be for the next three years for sure. So that to me sounds like somebody and appreciate the comment there. Terry Wax 982 
Sounds to me like someone doubts Caleb Williams, right? Because if Caleb is truly that good, right, we're not going to be awful for the next three years. Are That's they true. saying the Bears are going to be awful or we're going to be awful so those picks are going to be worth We're going to be awful so the picks are going to be great. So the commanders are going to be awful. So okay. commanders are going to be awful. We trade so up Caleb, Caleb Williams is going to suck, suck and then they're right. Yeah. Exactly. It's sort of what Terry Wags is. That's a Justin there. Fields fan. Most probably. There are a number of replies to Terry Wags, but I'm not going to go ahead and read replies. We're yeah. at the point now where we read just the main thread and comments there. Uh, we go over to Hibiscus seven, seven, nine shout out. If we pick in the 15 to 18 range next year, I'll be happy. This is something you had mentioned K dot about being competitive and a pick from 15 to 18 would represent a competitive season. And so that would actually represent success for the very first season of a recalibration. I'm going to start saying recalibration as well, because that is the term that both Adam Peters and Dan Quinn use. Any thoughts there, Kato? Uh, I think the the future, the NFL futures bets opened up because um, I was listening to a podcast and they have Washington at six and a half. Six and a half. You think we go over or under? I'm right around. The, I got to see what happens with this draft, but like. To me, it's just it's one of those things that you, you look at a lot of teams. You do not need to make the playoffs to be able to prove in case in point that you're on the way up, that you're right there. And if it happens the way that me and you both hope it does, and whoever we pick or draft at number two is sitting for a while, um, maybe it's a maybe it's a case where it's like, holy shit, with the rookie in there at the end of the season, they rattle off a few wins and they're looking really good going into next year. I'm if that is what happens, I am completely and absolutely content. I would agree with that as well. Then we go over to Tony. Shout out, Tony. Hey. Um, I think that's Commanders fan number two, maybe three with Chad Wilson. Uh, so number three so far. I don't like the idea of trading back, but I can't be mad if that's what they do. The fact is you don't know who is actually going to be good. The next CJ Stroud, Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, et cetera. We don't know how they will perform in the NFL. All three of the top QBs in the draft, I can only assume KDOT, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, can have success, and I'll be happy with any of them. But applying that also to J.J. McCarthy, I promise you guys and you, KDOT, that I will go back over the film and see, because his intangibles are there. I agree. And I also recognize I've got the blinders of the, like, yeah, all the propaganda over there is ridiculous. Um, but I will go ahead and do my best to look at it more cleanly. Tony, thank you for the comment. You convinced me to look over it. Not Kata. Uh, we go over to Chris Kavanaugh. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kata. Look, I was all for trading back. Remember, when we were doing our like best case scenario as far as quarterbacks. JJ McCarthy was number two on my list, which I think I got a couple comments about. What the fuck you is thought wrong we were going to get him in the second off. round. Well, you were right. The hype was stronger than I knew. The hype is I was real. already he there. He could be picked too. Look, I was already there. I like JJ a ton, but the idea, but the, but that my thought was like, if you can get him on a steal, then that to me, what I wanted was a situation to come out of this draft looking like the smartest motherfucker on the face of the earth. Because I, I know. was, you know, I want JJ McCarthy, and we could also get some more shit too. And it just seems as though, because what you're hearing about the JJ stuff is the stuff about him is being led by NFL teams, not yes. the media. The media that is, is not pressing it. That is important. The fans are definitely not. The fans are definitely not not doing it. It's yeah. NFL teams are like, no, we like this. JJ. We're more or less unified that we're like, no, thank you. Uh, you had also said something earlier that I meant to respond to. It just came back to me that yeah. no one would give a fuck if we went to the Super Bowl in a couple of years and five years with JJ McCarthy. And I completely agree. That is true. However, <laughs> yeah, however, we would absolutely give a fuck if we took J.J. McCarthy. He turned out to be eh. And then a Jaden Daniels or Drake May becomes really good wherever they are. And we go, that's who we were projected to get. And then we decided to overthink it. That's how it's going to be portrayed, KDOT. We decided to overthink it and get J.J. But all right, so I would and, give a fuck. Just, a lot of people would give a fuck. And just I just really, want to be clear. People I get it. Would give a fuck. Really quickly, the only position in which I don't give a shit, go get your guy, is quarterback. I, I, I could take that into consideration when it comes to wide receiver, cornerback, other sorts of things. To me, the variables involved in the quarterback position, as me and you have talked about, right, are so fucking vast Yes, that there's no quite talent. So my thing is that if I trust leadership and they have a favorite guy, do not put it to risk if you have the guy you like. Like, there's no reason to risk it. Go I agree with get that. your dude. Again, if they draft JJ too, I will get on board. 
I will. Right. I absolutely will. But I don't have to like it right now. Okay. Yeah, but it's like at. every fucking fan was upset about Dan Quinn and now they love him. <laughs> That's gonna be a touch different. We go over to Chris Cavanaugh, <laughs> 4575. Shout out. Shout out Tony one more time. Appreciate it, OG. Uh, but this is Chris Cavanaugh with a couple comments. Every one of Fields teammates' offense and defense loved him. And they are pissed that he was traded. That is true. You could see the reaction from any number of Bears players that they were not happy that Justin Fields got traded again to the Pittsburgh Steelers for a future sixth round pick that could end up being a future fourth round pick. And here's the other comment from Chris Kavanaugh. This is again in relation to a potential Caleb Williams trade, not after Justin Fields was traded. Caleb will be the Bears starting QB period. And I think that's where you and I both align, Kate, that we strongly feel at this point that Caleb Williams is going to be QB one and pick one overall for the Chicago Bears. Chicago can't sell it any other way. If it is true, the more, because like that comment, I've been doing more digging as far as that locker room situation. Um, I think that's why you have one of the big reasons that, uh, that Justin Fields ends up at Pittsburgh, and they make it very known that we try to do right by Justin. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it's the, it's the Justin, pick up the phone and call your teammates and tell them you're okay. <laughs> that's yeah, the, honestly. Like, that's that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, because here's another comment, and this is sort of to your uh, point initially there, from P. Nell 8, okay? Uh, Bears fans would lose their minds if they did not draft Hollywood Caleb. No Fields or Caleb, Ryan Poles would need to go into witness protection. And this is what we talked about in After the Pod last episode, which is we feel Ryan doesn't even have a choice at this point. He has to get Caleb Williams. No trade back, no getting cute and getting a JJ or Jaden or Drake at one. It has to be Caleb Williams at this point. Yeah, it's and too it's, risky. Which makes us the sort of de facto draft begins with Washington. And once again, the the like I I'm not going to be the guy that just went and said if you have your guy go get your guy. My problem with Chicago is that leading up to this they have fumbled in every which way and they handled the entire situation bad. And the coaching situation, everything, it's just been bad decision after bad decision that brought them to this point where they put themselves in a position where they don't have flexibility. All right. And then we go over to, and that was PNL8, shout out. And we go over to Hermit Rob. Shout out Hermit mm-hmm. Rob, who was commented a few times here, 5481. The Caleb thing is not dead yet. Anyone paying attention knows that Williams does not want to play there. That info came from people extremely close to the USC program. They have two four eyes Chicago is where quarterbacks go to die the Bears have never and I mean never produced a 4,000 yard passer that includes McMahon Harbaugh Roseman and Cutler Mm -hmm. Sam Howell freaking threw for 4,000 yards last year to put it in perspective he would have set the Bears franchise record for single passing yards in a season Um, they've never had a dedicated young quarterback program They just throw them in there and hope they'll solve all their problems. Couple that with playing in a broken down, 100-year-old, cold-ass White Sox of a stadium and recently trashing another first-round draft pick's career so badly all they got was a six-round pick does not bode well for Caleb putting ink to paper. The Williams could easily be telling Chicago, look, we could do this two ways. We could refuse to play there publicly. You can call our bluff and draft Caleb anyway, and we'll sit out. Bad look for us, but equally bad for Chicago on a national level. Or you can pick someone else at one or trade back a spot with D.C. Get a haul in picks, still get a blue chip quarterback, and nobody's the wiser. So it really, excuse me, so it really boils down to will Caleb actually sign there? There ain't no Andy Reid in the Windy City. I'm a Mayor McCarthy guy. Okay, so that's where Hermit Rob says. May or McCarthy. Another skinny college-style quarterback will be short-lived, probably in reference to Jaden Daniels. Not one has succeeded to date. In fact, the odds of any QB under 215 pounds winning consistently long-term are minuscule. Literally only two have kind of done that since 2000, Kirk Cousins and Russell Wilson. I don't know how much Lamar weighs. We won't talk about the fact it took JD five freaking years to understand defenses at the college level. Newsflash, it does not get any easier at the next level. Ask Justin Fields. And that is the comment from Hermit Rob. Kidot, your reaction to it. Um, look, if it got to a situation where Caleb was demanding, if they if they pulled like an Eli Manning um sort of situation, cool with me. Um, I'd like it to get to that point. 
So if like if we are going if the Caleb thing is not dead for Washington, I'd much rather it be after a public spat with Caleb Williams in Chicago because that would mean we don't have to pay that much. <laughs> like it just means hey, yeah. we're gonna swap guys, right? Like oh, pause. But the but the idea it happens. I'm joking. Yeah, <laughs> I don't mind swapping. Uh, the the idea that uh the yeah so that part of it cool me. I'd love to see that be the case. I doubt it at this stage, but man, eh, all right, whatever. Um, as far as like the success thing, once again, I can look at ev- I can look at all three of the quarterbacks that we're having that debate about, and I have absolute negatives and absolute positives about each and every one of them. I can look at Jaden Daniels' size, which was a good thing to see at the pro day. He was weighing a bit more, um, mm-hmm. but um, I I can I can see his size, but I can also say he's too risky with the football when it comes to running. He doesn't do this, that, and the other, and it took him forever to read a defense. I'm not sure what it's going to look like. You want to talk about like JJ McCarthy having talent around him? The motherfucker played for LSU and had Malik Neighbors and other guys. Pretty fucking talented. So, so like, the, so right. So like, you take everything with a fucking grain of salt, right? So yes. like the, um, and then like the Drake May thing. Drake May has the best arm in this draft. The motherfucker throwing a rope, and yeah, I can watch highlight reels and be like, "The fuck did you just see? What did you do that for?" You can do that with all these guys, just to be clear, right? All so it's of like, them. To me, you watch enough film, you develop who it is that you think looks good, this, that, and the other, and then you hope the professionals and the situation, the environment is enough to take it to the next level. Yep. That's it. Well said. Uh, we go over to HTTC7325. Shout out. I get very passionate when this name change thing comes up. Here's my feelings on this thing. We've been through enough. Can we all just focus on what we're building followed by turning this team into a winner and put this issue to rest for good. My goodness. I am completely on board with that. I don't care about the name. I just want this team to win. That is it. That is all I want. If this team wins a Super Bowl, they could be called the tennis balls. I don't care. This team, I just want to win. K-Dot, your thoughts? Yeah, man. The, the winning is everything. I think that you're at a position where we can have that conversation at some point, but I'd rather us have the conversation after we put together a goddamn winner. Um, yep. That's the priority. Uh, if you are someone, I can understand caring a lot about it. Um, I, I, As long as you're not saying go back to the other name, I can understand any argument from you. But yeah. the but the most people that I hear that make that the only thing that they do talk about are people that are just not paying attention to football stuff or are so afraid of the Dan Snyder era that they can't see any light at all. And those people I got to kind of not talk to or pay attention to because um, we got some shit going down and it'll take us waiting before we're going to get you to pay attention to anything football related anyway. Yeah, uh, we go over to Jess Anto. Shout out Jess Anto, 3438. I like Dune too. Doing two chicks at the same time. That is an oh! office space reference office space. that Pally for Life really enjoyed with the quick reply there. They added another center slash guard to the O-line since the last video. Well played, Jess Anto. Well Wonderful. played. They added another center slash guard to the O-line since the last video, and I don't think they are finished in free agency. As a quick reminder, that was Michael Dieter from the Houston Texans, and they did also add Olamide Zacchaeus to the wide receiver room. What are your thoughts on Snead going to the Titans and the contract? I believe our front office is not going to jump at the biggest names and contracts on the market until they see what they currently have on the roster and what needs to be addressed next and what needs to be addressed next season. Fortunately, this draft class is loaded at quarterback, offensive tackle, and wide receiver. I think those are our greatest needs after the free agents they brought in and released. They really solidified the center and guard spots. Again, that's going to be Tyler Biotish. That's going to be Michael Dieter. That's going to be Nick Allegretti. But I can't figure out what they are doing at right tackle. I really hope they are not sliding Sam Cosme over. He was excellent at guard. He's listed as a tackle on the team's website, though. And something of note is that Jeremy Chin is listed as an outside linebacker. And Jeremy Chin has said as much that he's probably going to be playing a bunch of linebacker. I don't see how they could watch Andrew Wiley's tape and see how he was good at right tackle. He's listed as a guard tackle. So it could be the route they are going because they are stuck with Wiley's contract. He might end up being an overpaid backup. 
I never understood the debate on thinner guys being injury risks. This is in contrast to, I believe, Hermit Rob's comment. Typically, the bigger guys are the ones with joint problems because of the additional weight on their frames. If you're talking about impacts from hits, Jaden Daniels is young and still has rubber bones with no injury history. RG3 already had an injury history before he was drafted. It's a good contrast there. That's absolutely Penix looks like a good quarterback, but I don't think you could draft him in the first round with his list of injuries, and he has had many between his time in Indiana and Washington. I think injuries are attributed to individual hits and genetics more than body types. As far as the comment mailbag, it's one of the things that separates your channels from the others. Most podcasters only read the super chats and occasionally mention pertinent comments. The mailbag makes it more of a personal forum for your channel as you both discuss each comment. A solo weekly mailbag show would be a good idea when you have an abundance of comments. Hip, slide, flip, tackle you next week, fellas. Greatly appreciate the comment there, Jess, along with also providing some advice on the comment mailbag, and we appreciate you enjoying the comment mailbag. 100%. Now, he did ask about Legereus Sneed going to the Tennessee Titans for a third-round pick mm -hmm. and what we thought of that with the contract. Kato, what do you think? Um, Sneed was always – he was the top corner candidate um, in this particular offseason. Everybody saw what he was able to do at Kansas City last year, which was just fucking lights out, right? Um, once again, going into that Super Bowl, my favorite unit was the Chiefs defense, and he they was were a big great, part of that. Man. Uh but yeah, I think we are in that situation where it's um, when you look at the moves that they made so far this offseason compared to the losses that we also sustained this offseason, it's just about being able to feel the team. And I think I heard Dan Quinn might have said as much at one point uh, in the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, they just need to be able to feel the roster <laughs> like the, the, that's the thing. And but the but what they've done is that the floor of that roster is higher than we've seen in recent times, right? So, like, now we're at a position where you start adding some of the young guys to see what it is you have. When I talked a couple of weeks ago about, like, do, doing the fuck it, you know, just sign guys like the L.A. Rams, you forget the, the Rams didn't do that in the first season, right? The Rams had that season to kind of evaluate where it is they, where it is they were. And, like, hey, there is a big-name free agent here that if we go get him, that puts this unit – in this upper echelon, right? But you need to see what you have without overpaying for that. And if your team is not going to be winning 10 games next year, why the fuck are you going to pay that much money for somebody to come in here when you already know what he is? Right. Um, it's just a matter of like, see what you have here, get the guys to develop top, top is the best level that they possibly can. And then you get some of the big name free agents potentially because they'll have flexibility to do so. So one of the things I want to mention is that I'm very glad Legereus Sneed is a fabulous corner, and you could make the case he was the best corner in the NFL last yeah. season, okay? Not just for the Kansas City Chiefs, across the league. I think he allowed his first touchdown in the Super Bowl. Yep, That's how good he was all year. I am so glad we did not do this. And the reason I'm glad we did not do this is because now I look at contract hierarchy. I want, first off, if you look at what Adam Peters has done, none of these have been insane deals. They have all been mid-level to one-year deals with veteran leaders. And you're going to have a rookie quarterback as well. It has been all about establishing the leadership group with affordable contracts and flexibility next season. I think to suddenly bring in a Legereus Sneed at four years, 76.4 million, sends a different message to the locker room because all of a sudden it is, we got the quarterback, we got these veteran leaders. And also this corner, by the way, is being paid about 20 million a year. Right. for the next four years. It just doesn't quite line up with the timeline. We don't know what we are yet. It is also going to be how Joe Witt does with the defense. It is also going to be how Jason Simmons does with the defensive backs, how Dan Quinn is going to do as head coach, how Cliff Kingsbury is going to do on the offensive side of things, Brian Johnson, Anthony Lynn, you name it. Okay, so I am very glad we did not give an enormous contract to a corner this offseason. If we do it next offseason, I'm totally for it because that is much more aggressive at that point once we've established right. an identity you're yeah. one of an identity i'm not looking for a 20 million a year corner as much as i love legerius need and his talent that's where i'm at there i just think we don't know enough about what we have yet exactly exactly and i think assigning that much of our uh, cap and our resources to just one player i think would be a bit risky at least at least this year yeah. willing to take that swing next year and the other thing that jess was mentioned was the uh the offensive line stuff with the cosme situation Yes. Um, I just think it depends. So it's like even the signing right now, Michael Dieter changes some things for me as far as what's happening on the offensive line, right? So like I assume Tyler Biotis was going to be the center. 
um, starting Still center, starting up, probably will be. Um, yep. Dieter has uh, a lot of experience playing both positions, so he slots over to a guard. I like the idea of an Allegretti, um, of the interior three being Allegretti, Biotish, and um, Cosby. Cosby. Oh, not well, no, the other, the, the guy I just said, um, Dieter. Yeah. I, Cosme did. Go- I thought Cosme was fine at uh, right tackle. Um, I, once again, there, 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 there's, there's usually situations where you could have a guy be like, "Hey, he does better here, but he could still play here." Um, yeah. and when you see some of these dudes, I don't mind even. Once again, I'm deferring to the coaches. It doesn't hurt to be diversified in what you can do. Um, especially if you can do it at a high enough level or with additional coaching, or you can do better at this position because you can trust the guys inside more. So, like, I, I don't know. So, like, I, I just think that there are some options there, but I expect also that this they're going to draft some fucking um, offensive linemen. Oh, offensive linemen, yeah, for yeah. sure. And actually, Jim Harbaugh had a really good quote on that, which was that he was talking about position groups. Mm-hmm. And what's the one position group independent of others in order to perform well? And he's literally like, it's just the offensive line. So he was like, well, wide receivers, quarterbacks, running backs. I don't, they all need the offensive line in order to do their jobs. Yep. You cannot do it without a good offensive line. And he went as far as to say the defensive line, because he was like defensive lineman came up to me when I said that. And we're like, well, we're also independent. And he's like, oh yeah. Well, do you like when the offense goes on 12 play drives and you get a bit of a break and stuff like that? I was like, oh, no, actually I do like that. Well, it turns out you're dependent on him too. So right. he crushed that comment, by the way. And it was, yeah, just he like, also crushed JJ like, McCarthy. It was oh. Oh. Oh, my God. OK, we're, we're going to get to after the pod in the moment, but I got to read this from Pally for Life. Last but certainly not least, this is a fun comment. Three quick, equally important notes. First one, hmm. after extensive research, i.e. watching five minute highlights of Williams, May and Daniels, I'm sold on Daniels. If he can put on a few pounds and protect himself, he's the guy. Pally for Life. Amen, brother. And then we go over to the second point. Do you gents have anything planned when, not if, the channel hits 1,000 subscribers? We're currently at 828. Please subscribe. Uh, I don't know about the rest of the District Divided family, but I may be interested in some swag. That would Mm. be interesting. Just open up an entire store, KDOT. And then third, which is very important, share this shit. Monsieur X with... I'm going to go ahead and call that the comment of the day just for the amount of love the channel got. And also, bro, Jaden Daniels. So, you know, I'm with that. Nah, Jess still had the comment of the day, but that one made me feel good. Jess always has the comment of the day. Jess, yeah, it's guaranteed. But that's even, it, did, was this an additional comment or is this uh, like a, it was no, just, it's, a, it's its own comment. It's Absolutely. Own comment. Got it. Yeah, that's right. why I read yeah, it. That's, well, that's awesome. That's, yeah. um, that's good. It's a good feeling. 4,000. Uh, yeah, I'm the merch. I need the money. I mean, um, yeah, Ahmed had to loan me money a couple of weeks ago. And actually, I got to tell him that I don't have it yet. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. So, like, yeah, merch, baby. It, baby. Let's do some merch. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get some merch going. We all want okay. hoodies, t shirts. I can design some shit. Hey, 1K, uh, Pally for Life, we'll talk to you about that as well. 1K subscribers, we can figure something out together. That'll be a lot of fun. Uh, to I want to go aggressive, like uh, just... Dish Divided Brand and Fleshlights. That was a common mailbag. This is District Divided, a DC sports podcast, more specifically a Washington Commanders podcast. There's a lot of after the pod energy there, K Dot. I am of it. That is K Dot. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, comment as you always do. Jess Anto, thank you for the feedback on the comment mailbag. We would continue to encourage people to provide that. And K Dot. Sure, you want me to do- I'm just to share this shit. I was so worried. Not the flashlight. Don't, like, share, could, don't share your flashlight. Honestly, go and not there, share we... your flashlight. Share this pod, not your flashlight. Appreciate you guys so much. After the pod begins right now, it's unsanitary. Let's talk about Caleb Williams. Okay. The reaction to him being at the USC women's game has been ridiculous. I say it's ridiculous. I, I think I, it's been ridiculous. I just don't agree with it. So, like, but it, to to think, it's not a surprise. Um, me and you just we've talked about him being a weird dude, at least. But even where you saw him a weird that, dude, it, right? That wasn't even what I was referencing when I was talking about weird. I was just the way he was answering questions, that demeanor. That's what I was referring to. This stuff, I don't <clears> give two <throat> fucks about. What? 
<laughs> I'm just saying. All right, all right. All right. I'm like, I, I'm, I'm as woke as the next guy. But the idea that we could say the way he answers questions is weird, but not the pink nail <laughs> polish football player. I'm just saying it's, it's all weird energy. And but weird meaning not the norm. That's it. That's the only thing. That's the only thing I mean by weird. We it's said not quirky. 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 Quirky is probably a better way to go about it. It's just the should have got a Carlton, but he was just too talented at football. That's probably where he would have gone. <laughs> it's he's just he's one of those dudes. It's just. But I think that if somebody said this. Um, it might have been Bamani Jones. Might have been Bamani Jones. So I do yeah. appreciate. I disagree with him a lot, but I, I I do appreciate a lot what he says. I love the way his mind works. Um. What you're seeing, case in point, is the first true blood Gen Z quarterback. He hmm. is. This is a generational change. It's the same way that, like, during you have the era of football where anytime a quarterback had long hair or beard in the 70s or anything, it was like, who the fuck is this hippie playing quarterback shit, right? Like, we want a blue collar, certain type of look of guy. And it was just a generational change. You go from that baby boomer era to, hey, we got hippies and shit here in this kind of, right? It's like, then you go into just, I just think that what's going to be hard for people to see is that he's going to really, truly break the mold. But he's also going to be somebody that, uh, that the younger generation truly resonates with because they don't what we would say is weird or quirky this is normal it's just this is the people right. that are around and stuff so it's like yeah it's it, it's like i watched euphoria <laughs> he'd be he'd be perfect on that fucking show oh my god right? like, he would what like a crazy show that is but it's like but it's just that it's just guys like i have to come to terms with the same way you got to come to terms with i'm 35 i'm now at the age where I've seen the, it blows my mind still that I've now seen entire like Hall of Fame careers. I've remembered the, them in their entirety. Like I'm, I'm old now compared to like shit that I've seen in football. Right. Like the guys that are playing right now are so much younger than me. It's nuts. Like the seeing all the children of the guys that I watch play play now is still blowing my Marvin mind. Harrison Jr. Right. As an example. So it's like it's just coming to terms with like, hey, Asante Samuels kid. Um, right fucking hell who else i was just thinking about it antoine winfield jr yep that's There's crazy all this, it's that it's really like crazy. even i just saw a tape of uh chris henry's son playing football and i'm like god damn rest in peace all right like it's just it, like that's what it comes down to so it's just one of those things where what i would say is that anytime i don't find the word weird to be bad there's no negative connotation for me. Quirky, no negative connotation for me. I like those things actually. It's like shit, I'm my double fucking ear piercings, my goddamn well, well, crazy you, hair. You know like, what I was thinking about? Because there's also the lens of like face of the franchise quarterback. Like it's one thing, like, let me put it to you this way. Yeah. Wide receivers have been divas forever. Right. But you're also not necessarily looking for him to be the leader of the squad. Okay. You think it's diva energy though? Or are you just think? No, 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 no. I'm just okay. speaking to about wide receivers in general. We had the diva era, right? We had like Terrell Owens. We had like, those guys is what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, it was yeah. Where you yeah. have Chad Ochocinco, Chad formerly Chad Johnson, like you have these guys that are like, give me the ball, I'm the best, all that jazz. That wide receivers can just do whatever they want. People were just like, okay, whatever. If you had a QB do that type of thing, people view it differently. So sort of, but I mean, people had a would. very nice. But it's the thing is like still that wide receiver era. There's a ton of people that still have a lot of negative. Because I'm not calling, anyway. I'm not calling Caleb a diva. I just want to be very. No, clear I get what you're that. saying, but the right, but that so, diva era of wide receiver. Yeah. If you remember coming up, there was a lot more negative stories and negative publicity about all of them. There was positive anything. Oh yeah, right? especially To. But I also think the thing with the wide receiver position is that you're so like we were just talking about what position is more important and which ones are more dependent on anything. There is no more dependent on other player position than wide receiver. Which Literally, is a quick I shout out to, to Terry play. McLaurin continuing right. to produce year in year out. My God, we really have something there. I would love part of my success for mm -hmm. this year is letting Terry McLaurin shine. That'd be awesome. Because he he needs to be talked about more across league circles, man. But he's you remember the so game? Good. You remember the game afterwards? He's like, I just ran cardio. Yeah. There's no you literally can't do anything until somebody gives you the football. So like there is an element of like, hey, I gotta make this a fucking show. I gotta make everybody be very aware of who the fuck it is I am. If they don't throw me the ball, I need fans in everybody's ears. I need everybody in everybody's ears. There was a strategy to it. Right. Um, in order to get what he needed to get on the field. But the other Caleb Williams part about it is remember one of the big stories coming out last year was him crying 
with his mom on the sideline. I don't really care about that either. We don't eat. We don't because we're more we're younger compared to a lot of the other fans in the NFL or right. people that, or football writers. There's still not a lot of millennial writers and journalists out there, right? There's yeah, still a true. lot of guys that are you older. You see the shit Tom Lavero puts out. My God, oh. you see what I'm saying? So it's like yeah. there's the element of like if we if we were more that voice because they kind of shit on millennials being a voice of anything because the other guys won't retire or pass away. It's also but, true. The, the element is like, it's not that crazy for us because we're that bridge generation. We're the generation where it's okay to go to therapy. It's okay to show your mm-hmm. emotions. It's okay to do this kind of shit. We don't look at you any less of a man or any less machismo or anything with that. Other than that, like that growing swell, like the Andrew Tate love and sons of bitches. But beyond that, right. we understood, we understand that, right? But the you look at a previous generations, they're like, no, fuck that. You're not allowed to show that, right? So there's that gap. And then you got the dude that's like, I'm going to cry. I'm going to wear pink fucking uh, nail polish. And this is who I am. And I love that he's unapologetically him. That I do. That's that the I huge do really part like. about it. Right. Like, I'm not yeah. going to change. Your mind. Before the season, um, last season, we had the debate about uh, the Eric B enemy thing when the um, when it came out that the players were upset with him and the way that he was talking and they went to Ron Rivera and everything. And you remember the way that I looked at it was. I like the idea that if somebody's uncomfortable with the communication, a lot yes. of communication, be able to that. articulate it, right? That feels like it shakes a football player to its core. No, you got to be you sh- sh- strong, silent. You shut type. up and you keep going. Right. Right. Like shut up and put up. This is not what makes these young dudes do. Th- it's just you. It's a totally different vibe. That's fair. And it's important for us to adapt to that and be like, hey, this is not our traditional le- or like the more traditional lens of the people that are older than us also does not work with this current crop of athletes. It is different. And it I completely, that's a really good point. I'm just not. And the thing is like, I love taking through like, is learning lessons from the past in history, taking a look at what works some some through lines. Right. Yeah. But always trying to be on the cutting edge of what's next. That's what makes somebody special. That's what makes you above and beyond what anybody else is doing, right? When you can be on the cusp of whatever's new, um, is like understanding the tried and true ways and how it is that I can adjust it or change it and make progress beyond what's happening. Yeah. And I look at this like new crop of players and I look at Caleb Williams being the first guy who I'm rooting for in this way to kind of change the absolute mold of what it is expected or understood about quarterback because it's still being fought. I mean, even last generation stuff is still being fought. People still talk shit about Lamar Jackson, his wanting to run or that athletic type of quarterback because everybody has in the mold of like just what it is they like traditionally. It's all bullshit. By the way, how Lamar was pretty thin at Louisville. Yeah, they Lamar and um Lamar and Jaden are pretty much the same. But you also remember Lamar well, because sat. I, I forgot who it was that said that hey the the thin QB just doesn't do it. Yeah, no, Lamar put on weight though. So Lamar yeah, he did, and the did. expectation would be that Jayden yeah, the does same too. thing with Jaden. Right. But remember, Lamar didn't start day one. So he's, like you people, he sat ten weeks. He yep. sat and he he put on more weight. The only difference that I want people to understand between Lamar and Jaden, Lamar does a much better job of not getting hit. Yes. Like that, that to me is the, that's the difference. I, I'm not saying Jay, Jaden's awesome, but like RG three was the same way. I was worried about RG three because he got hit. <laughs> like that's, he would get hit. He would so it's get like, killed weekly. So it's not about it being like, it's not calling anybody soft. It's not calling them injury prone. It's, I guess, a scientific fact that if you get hit more than other people, there's a higher likelihood you'll get hurt. Right. Like, and then if you're a quarterback, I want to limit that because you're supposed to be the chief of the team. So, like, Mm -hmm. what the fuck am I doing making progress if you're not out there playing? So, like, that's the only thing I look at is self-preservation in that way. Yeah. And so that would obviously be the biggest thing. And and to Tony's point, uh, which was also just another damn good comment. Man, we we got a lot of really good comments. comments. Yeah, uh, we always do. But, like. Today in particular, I feel like we had some really, really good ones. Um, and it was fun getting the Bears fans involved too. But to, to Tony's point, it is impossible to know which one is going to be great. He, he had mentioned like CJ Stroud, Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, ultimately a crapshoot. And here we are again with Jaden Daniels, with Drake May, with Caleb Williams. Um, I guess the way I'm gesturing is pick one, <laughs> pick two, three, four, whatever. And JJ McCarthy. Like Thank maybe you. JJ actually is the best. Listen, that took a lot for me. John, I'm growing, sure you said his name. growing within the hour. I did, I did. 
I did. I'll give him a fair shake. But this is my just I'm in the early stages of the possibility. Get the fuck over it. Don't 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 be don't be one of them Commander Ben Johnson guys, man. You see, you, you know, give me no, that. No, I, I, hey, listen, I moved off that. OK, OK, but okay. I'm just the, uh, I'm working. I'm working. Look, I, I don't know how many times I got, we've taught me and you since we started this fucking podcast since. Since you started this podcast, since I was a guest on the podcast, since uh, we did the podcast that was with pre-COVID, pre-COVID, since literally we did the just podcast, COVID. like just when before. there were five guys on the podcast, right? Like yep. back during that era when I would, my tried and true, there's a way to build a team, there's a way and a patience needs to happen at the quarterback position. I've been preaching since I could watch fucking football, pretty much. Um, there is a bigger issue in development than there is evaluating when it comes yes. to these quarterbacks. I'm going to keep stressing that I think that the outside of Caleb, who I think is special, the other three guys are all, in my opinion, from what I've seen, capable of being absolute, tried and true, good starters in the National Football League. And I think that if they're not, it has a lot more to do on where they landed in the coaching staff and what it is they've done to them. For That's example, For example, if we were to look at... The New England Patriots right now. That is a shakier landing spot than us right now. For I don't example. think the Patriots should draft a quarterback. It, it is to that point. Right. Right. Because who is their number one receiver? Who is their number two receiver? Right. Like their offensive line. Is it good? There is. There are so many questions in New England. And they are going to feel pressured to play that guy immediately. That it yeah, is Bell's left. It's Robert. Yeah. And Robert's old. So mm-hmm. like right. And Robert has a lot more to say than people realize he does. Yep. Yep. And so like that is, for example, a situation where if I'm one of the top QBs and I'm looking at situation, that is the least desirable situation of the lot. You see what I'm saying? So like I- Yeah, to your point. But it's the same. But I do the same when people say we should have drafted Justin Herbert. What makes you think he would have been successful here? Like that's like I I can go and do this thing. Let's take a simpler example: Christian Gonzalez and Emmanuel Forbes. Just in terms of the uh, coaching, we talked about how if Kyle Hamilton or Christian Gonzalez were drafted here, they do not look like the Kyle Hamilton and Christian Gonzalez you know because of environment. So it goes even across the quarterback. It is across positions. but and once again, there is no more position that's harder. And I mean, I, I do think cornerback is probably the hardest position just because of the aspect of the game. Now but, you can't hip tackle. But I, but I, but I do, yeah. But I do think. Well, it should have been bad. But the the idea that uh, cornerback you can rely on certain physical gifts or instinct. Quarterback you need to be a student of the game just as much as you have to work as your physical abilities. Even more than that, you got to be a good student. Right. Like you got to learn. You got to be able to do some shit uh, like in here. Right. And the, the the thing with quarterback is that there's so many variables to it. Like the the what the conversation that I've loved recently when they talked to Adam Peters and talked to Dan Quinn about Sam Howell. Um, and it's like, no, it was better for both of us. Like it's it, he's got to go somewhere where he's got a fair shot to go uh, start over, go learn mm-hmm. something and have a legitimate shot at doing this. Go. Like, sometimes you need that shit. Like, I look at this last year with Sam Howell, and I understand the howlers out there, right? There were things you can absolutely look on he tape and be like, I like promise. Sam Howell. Right. And the disservice that they did to him over the course of this season was ridiculous. Yes. I can go back to Dwayne Haskins here and the way that they That's threw amazing. his ass out there to the Wolves, right? Yep. Like, there are so many elements to this thing that you have to do it properly. Then on top of that, yes, the evaluation part is a part of it because sometimes the dude just doesn't want to work. Look at Jamarcus Russell's. I just don't want to. I don't want to work. I got my money. I don't give a fuck. Albert right? Hainsworth, we know well aware. What? Right. Yeah. Or you have dudes that just don't have the physical tools to do it, which is, but I, I'm saying I've looked at enough tape so far. I don't see any of these guys not having the physical tools to do it. Yeah. I just like the, the conversation now is developing right. God damn it. And I don't want the same way Chicago's backing themselves into a corner. I still respect the shit out of Ryan Poles if he said, fuck it, we're trading off of this, or we're gonna draft a guy that we um, fucking that want. That would be story gonna, of fuck. the offseason. It would be right. so cool. Stick to your do what you need to do to do right by the guy that you select. That's your utmost thing. 
Do right by the guys you select. They are not your savior. They're 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 supposed to come in and learn to be the best professional they can be with you. If you're a ma- everybody knows that shitty manager they had at a job that didn't give a fuck about development, that expected things from you without helping and doing anything else, and throw your ass out in the water. It's not look. Some people flourish in that. They are few and far between, and that should not be an expectation of anyone. If you can help them along the way. I think that's an excellent place to stop. This was District 5 DC Sports Podcast. Thank you guys for listening. And we will catch you next week. Enjoy the weekend. And we'll see you in April. Bye, everybody. In DC, we're just hoping that you listen. 